Hey guys, welcome back. I don't know if I'm with you or not, uh, but uh, either way, don't forget that I'm available to you. Uh, email me, tweet me, do what you have to do to get in touch with me uh, if you don't understand something. China, for a lot of kids, is a little bit sticky, okay? Um, first of all, I don't think it's any harder than any of the other units. The difficulty tends to be with uh, remembering the names, remembering the places, and things like that, pronouncing things. Now, let me tell you this right off the bat. You do not have to know how to pronounce things for the AP. The AP doesn't know what, care if you can pronounce them. They care if you know what they are. You're going to know what they are. I know what they are. I'm going to tell you what they are. We're going to get started. We're jumping into China right now. So why China? China's history goes back at least 4,000 years. Today it has close to 1.4 billion people in it, the largest population of any country in the world. Recent development has been rapid in China. Since the 1970s, more liberal economic policies have been implemented known as reform and opening, which we're going to talk about. Uh, this is the defining trait of uh, the Chinese version of communism. The country has been focusing on opening the economy and accepting entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs while maintaining control on politics, as with the violent repression at the Tiananmen Square in 1989. So the world's largest countries by total uh, area are Russia, Canada, the United States, and China. And so China's climate is very, it's not just, it's, it's warm, it's, it's temperate, it's this. China's climate changes depending on where you're at, much like the United States does. China's climates and geographical regions vary greatly with unhabitably cold regions in the Northeast, deserts in the Northwest, in the southwest are the mountainous regions of Tibet and the Himalayas. Um, and so with this in mind, you can take a guess where most of the population lives. They're in the southern seaboard regions of China. The Yangtze and the Yellow Rivers flow east to the Pacific, and they are crucial to China. Uh, the Three Gorges Dam, which was built on the Yangtze, opened in 2008 and uh, amid a lot of alarm as it was the largest dam ever built. This thing is huge. Check out the YouTubes on it. Uh, you will be amazed at this thing. But it also has the risk for huge environmental disasters. It could wipe out millions of people if it fails. So um, give and take here, okay? Despite the population of 1.4 billion, the people of China are very homogenous. Uh, the major ethnicity is Han, and it makes up over 90% of the population. That's unheard of throughout most of the world, and we're going to find out why that is as we get into their history. And so uh, the first dynasty to rule over China was the Shang Dynasty. Uh, that's the 18th to the 11th centuries B.C., um, their rule saw the creation of Chinese written character. Um, a unified empire was then achieved under the Qin Dynasty, which built the Great Wall. The Han Dynasty uh, managed to centralize sovereign power and promoted great cultural development. At this time, China was far, far, far ahead of Europe. Uh, in terms of timekeeping, astronomy, mathematics, all of these things. Confucianism uh, influenced emperors with ideas of fixed hierarchies, obedience to authority, and meritocracy, the last of which was instrumental to creating a bureaucracy and professional civil service. So no spoil system at this point, right? Meritocracy. After the Han Dynasty collapsed, China was divided for four centuries. Uh, the Sui and the Tang Dynasties eventually unified China again and restored the bureaucratic institutions of that Han, Han Dynasty. At this time, the bureaucracy became the glue that would hold our, that, that country together. Uh, so when the Ming Dynasty comes to power, China was still the world leader in science, uh, technology, but during this time, Europe was experiencing the Renaissance, and we're going to move into the start of the Industrial Revolution. China does not undergo these changes, and there are three uh, explanations for why this was the case, cultural, economic, and ge geographic. So let's talk about each of those. The cultural explanation lies in Confucianism, which asserts that China is the center of the world, and outside knowledge and information are in inferior to the internal knowledge. 
The economic explanation postulates that because working in the public service was very richly rewarded, the most talented people were directed into government and not into innovation, into science, into research. And this also meant that most of the economic power was in the hands of the state. The geographic explanation explains that uh, European states were forced to develop because a lack of innovation could lead to economic and military defeat. So, for example, European nations could not afford to abolish the study of navigation. Uh, states that resisted progress soon disappeared from the map. Uh, China could reject technology and embrace isolation because it faced no rival powers on its borders. Okay, So it did not have challenges to the policies that were already existed. So the Portuguese are the first Europeans to reach China in 1514, uh, but others soon to follow uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries. And they wanted trade contacts with China, uh, but those remained under tight control from the Chinese. However, China and its empire began to lose its power to control interactions with the outside world. And this happens with the first opium war against the British in 19, sorry, 1839 to 1842, which started because the British were smuggling opium into China to try and break its tight control of economic and trade relations. Uh, so Britain is basically doping China um, and hoping to, um, to force the Chinese to open up trade relations with Britain. Uh, as a result, Hong Kong was ceded to the British, and they ruled over it until 1997. Um, in 1911, a rebellion abolished dyna dynastic rule altogether, and China was declared a republic. Uh, that republic did not last, and China fell into the hands of warlords. And so during this period, there's two competing organizations that arose, the Chinese Communist Party and the Nationalist Party. Um, the later... Uh, the latter of these was um, helped by the student protest in 1919 uh, that became known as the May 4th movement. Uh, this has nothing to do with the Star Wars May 4th, which is May the 4th be with you. The Kuomintang, as it was called, was led by Sun Yat-sen and was involved in nationalist revolts um, rejecting uh, foreign influence. The Chinese Communist Party, on the other hand, was organized in 19, 1921 by one of the leaders of the May 4th movement. When Sun died, Chiang Kai-shek, leader of the KMT's military branch, took over and took control of much of the country, pushing the Communist Party into the countryside. Uh, while the country, Communist Party was being repressed, Mao Zedong was accumulating power within that party. He believed that it was possible to build an army out of the peasantry, a concept that was a big difference between uh, Chinese communism and the Soviet model of communism. So in the Soviet Union, um, having the peasants weaponized is not a good idea. They're, they're, the fear is that they're going to rise up uh, uh, against the, the government. Where in China, that is the goal, is to weaponize uh, that massive population that they have. So the communists had to flee west from the KMT, leading to the so-called Long March in 1934-35. Uh, they traveled a total of 6,000 miles, and although they got support from the peasantry, uh, only about 10% made it to the final uh, destination. The communists and the KMT then were united in 1937 because they had a common em enemy in Japan after Japan attacked their country. Uh, by the end of World War II, the communists had control of all of the countryside uh, because of their support from the peasantry. Uh, they marched on Beijing unopposed, and the KMT fled to Taiwan and declared itself the true Chinese government. Uh, this was the Chinese government that the United States recognized at that time. So uh, let's jump ahead a little bit to 1956, and Mao uh, ex experimented with allowing criticism in the country. Uh, he launched a so-called Hundred Flowers campaign, uh, where he encouraged people to criticize the government. He then removed the critics from their positions of authority and persecuted them after doing so. Uh, the Great Leap Forward was an effort at decentralization. Uh, communu communes, not communism, communes were created and given autonomy, uh, which they mainly used to create substandard products. Uh, the regime was authoritarian, but there was a movement towards devolution. Uh, the Great Leap Forward turned out to be a disastrous attempt to modernize China uh, through localized industries and agricultural communes. It instead led to famine and about uh, millions, if not tens of millions, uh, of deaths. 
Uh, Mao stepped down from his post as the party chair in 1959, but then decided to place himself back at the center of power through his quotations from Chairman Mao, which is normally known as the Little Red Book, mostly because it was written in a Little Red Book. Uh, Mao encouraged the public to start the Cultural Revolution, which conducted mayhem across authority against authority figures, including the bourgeoisie and the landowners. Uh, there was chaos and their civil war, but by the end of 1968, the army had restored order. Uh, Mao dies in 1976, and Deng Xiaoping be eventually comes to power. Deng had lost his position twice during the Cultural Revolution, but after Mao dies, uh, he pro proved to be the best strategist and outmaneuvered even Mao's widow uh, to get power. Deng started the policy uh, uh, of reform and opening. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, he was less strict on communist ideology and desired foreign relations with capitalist countries, which began uh, with, with Nixon's visit in, in 1972, President uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, the one area that Deng did not reform, however, was politics. The economy was allowed to change, but political processes were not. Uh, the harshly authoritarian manner of dealing with the possibility of dissent was still seen in 1989 in Tiananmen Square. Uh, we're going to be watching a whole video about uh, Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square called Tank Man in class. That's why we're not going to talk a ton about it here in, in, uh, uh, in the lecture. So after Deng died, power was transferred to Zhang Zemin in 1997 and then to Hu Jintao. Uh, but there was no change in the level of authoritarianism. Uh, the current leader, um, Xi Jinping, uh, began his tenure in 2012, and his signature policy package is called the Chinese Dream. It calls for, the ch for China to prosper by 2021, which is the centennial of the Chinese Communist Party. So political rule in China has been authoritarian and centralized for 2,000 years. Uh, there has been economic liberalization, but the organizational structure remains a party state. Um, th that authoritarianism paired with democratic centralism means that the individual is always subservient to the Communist Party and that everyone submits to the party's authority. Leaders impose their decisions on those below them and all abide by decisions made by the center. Since China has a nomenclature uh, system, that is easily achieved. China's government is set up in what we call organizational parallelism, which means that all government executive, legislative, and administrative agencies are matched or duplicated at every level of organization by a corresponding party organ. So uh, we kind of look, uh, there's a, um, if I'm going to try and think of what page it's on in the book. Maybe we can come up with it later. But there's a graphic in the, in the text that shows the, the corresponding agencies. Here's the party. Here's the government agency that goes with it as we move up. This is what's going to come about having that one-party state. So societal control is achieved through the Maoist practice of Danue, uh, the work unit system that gives all people an affiliation and a lifelong group based on occupation. So you're going to be in this group. This is your job. Okay. And Haku, which is a household registration that fixes population in a given location. Here's where you're going to live. Okay. Uh, more recently, there has been a floating population of over about 250 million people. Uh, think about it, That's almost the size of America, uh, just kind of floating around, uh, who have abandoned their designations by the government and traveled to the city in order to seek employment. Uh, the Constitution allegedly dictates how the country is going to be uh, governed allegedly because it's really the Communist Party that does. It gives all formal power to the state and the party. That means very little because political power has not been properly institutionalized. The leaders have relied on their informal power bases uh, rather than um, formal powers. Uh, rule of law in China has generally not prevailed because everything is subjected to ideological party control. So the essential features in China are as follows. The legislative executive system is the Communist Party authoritarian regime. The legislature, which is nominal authority at best, is unicameral uh, National People's Congress and the first unicameral system that we've seen in this course so far. Both uh, Russia and the UK had uh, bicameral systems. Uh, the division of power is unitary with the main geographic units called uh, provinces 
and the chief judicial body, much like the legislator, has nominal authority, uh, but it is called the Supreme People's Court. So let's start with the Chinese Constitution. The Constitution vests formal authority in both party and state leg executive and uh, legislative offices. The personal nature of political rule has weakened the strength of the Western notion of rule of law in China. Although there is a collective agreement to avoid returning to how things were under Mao, that tyranny under Mao, a power still remains very much invested in the paramount leader and the oligarchy. When we look at government institutions in China, we have to look at the Communist Party institutions, because like I said, they're parallel, they go together. National Party and uh, the National Party Congress and the parties is the party's represent. The National Party Congress is the party's representative body and party nominating convention. It meets every five years and is used more as a venue for announcing policy and leadership changes rather than for actual creation of policy. So they're kind of like a, um, a convention for uh, like the Republican Party in, in America or the Democratic Party, the, the party convention. That's kind of what we're looking at here. It has over 2,000 delegates. It meets way too infrequently to actually conduct any real uh, policymaking. The Central Committee only has about 200 members uh, who vote to elect the Politburo, the Politburo Standing Committee, uh, and the General Secretary. However, they, uh, they vote using ballots on which everyone is unopposed uh, because the party leaders determine who the leadership was going to be. So they have a vote, but there's only one person on the ballot. Uh, changes have occurred in the 1980s, though. Uh, the Central Committee members are elected by secret ballot now, and there are more candidates than available seats. And so um, the government is saying, choose from these couple of people, or the, the party, rather, is saying, choose from these couple of uh, of people. Uh, the Politburo Standing Committee meets every week and is led by the General Secretary, who is also the President of the country. Uh, the Politburo is like a cabinet. Uh, each one of its members has a portfolio that roughly corresponds to um, areas for which ministers in the State Council are responsible, so defense or education, etc. Uh, the CCP has its own uh, bureaucracy called the Secretary of the Decisions of the Politburo and distributes forces, and it reports directly to the Politburo, and the CMC chair is the uh, paramount leader of the commission. Follow all that? Make sure that you're reading this stuff in the book. This is very different than the organizations that we've kind of evolved in uh, Russia and the UK. So in the executive branch, the head of state is the president, and the, gov the head of government is the premier. Uh, the president of the PRC is the head of state, but that office is usually held by the paramount leader who picks his own successor. So not an election, he picks his own successor. Uh, in fact, not only did Deng choose his own third generation replacement, Zhang Zemin, but also tapped fourth generation successor, Hu Jintao. Uh, just as Zheng and Hu each served a decade as head of state, uh, head of party, and head of military, um, it's anticipated that the current fifth generation leader, uh, Xi Jinping, will likewise complete a 10 year term as a CCP general secretary in 22, uh, as PRC president in 23, and CMC chair in 2023. Uh, the state council supposedly runs the daily government activity and is led by the premier, who is supposed to be the head of the government. I keep saying supposed to be, okay? However, the candidate for premier is a single candidate is recommended by the Central Committee, and their recommendation is always the determining factor in who gets picked. Uh, the premier serves a five-year term and is typically a second or third ranking member of the PSC. The premier oversees 25 bureaucratic ministries and commissions. The legislative branch of the government is made up of the National People's Congress. The National People's Congress is unicameral, we said that already, uh, that is supposed to be the parliament. It is elected every five years, and it is huge. It has close to 3,000 delegates. It is supposed to make the laws, but it has never had an influential role in policymaking. Again, who has that role? The Communist Party. Okay, so make sure that we're getting this. Uh, one book... Uh, or sorry, our book, uh, when talking about the judiciary system, says that China is ruled by law rather than having a rule of law. The judicial system is difficult to define in China. Uh, prior to 1978, there wasn't even a penal code. 
Uh, and now that there is one, its provisions are used selectively based on the elite's ideological positions and uh, proclivities. Uh, there's no rule of law because the elites are not subject to the law. Instead, they use law in order to rule. So they can decide, oh, you broke a law, but this person who did the exact same thing, there may be a member of the Communist Party, they're fine. Okay. In spite of criticism from Amnesty International and similar groups, China keeps people in labor camps uh, without access to legal counsel. And during some of the strike hard campaigns, people are executed by the hundreds if not by the thousands. Uh, based on estimates, it seems that China uh, executes as many people in a few months as the rest of the world does in just three or four years. Uh, and though China's massive population does account for some of this statistic, even in terms of per capita executions, um, Iran and North Korea are really the only ones who can compete as far as um, number of executions. As far as local government goes, uh, China has historically had a strong central government that has consistently resisted federalism. Uh, there is a central structure of a parallel party government rule in, in local governments. Uh, be sure to check that out. That's on page 430 of our O'Neill textbook. Uh, there are 34 provincial level administrative units, 3,000 counties, and over 40,000 townships. Then there's also more than 700,000 villages. Think of all of those local governments. So over the past three decades, central political leaders have been experimenting a little bit with limited local democratization, but only on a very small, isolated scale. So very, very small scale, but they've been testing it a little bit. What's this going to look like if we decide down the road to go to this in China? Look at what I said, though, over the past three decades this is happening. So this is not evolving anything uh, very quickly. Uh, the People's Liberation Army, comprising uh, China's Army, Navy, Air Force, is the world's largest military force. It helped Mao rise to power. It played a key role in the 1950 uh, 50s economic reconstruction. Uh, it halted the Red Guard in the Cultural Revolution, and it curtailed the 1989 uh, Tiananmen Square protests, killing hundreds of probably uh, thousands. Membership in the CCP remains essential if you're going to acquire any political influence. You have to be a member of the Chinese Communist Party. Membership is sought after and selective. Over time, uh, different societal sectors have been targeted for inclusion in the CCP. Uh, there's no institutionalized vice office in China, uh, and that's to help ease uh, transition to a successor. Deng's institutionalized um, the secession process after chaos followed Mao's death. Uh, so rather than have all that chaos, I'm going to select my successors. And so here's who's coming after me. Um, as far as the civil society goes, the first thing we have to know are the gongos, G-O-N-G-O's. Uh, they are government-operated, non-government organizations that are formed by the CCP. These are led by the party elites, and they aim to spread propaganda as well as implement policy. So even the non-governmental agencies are run by the government. Okay, These are the gongos. Uh, the party state has authorized work of a half million NGOs, non-governmental organizations. They are restricted to non-political areas, and they ha are subject to government oversight. Foreign NGOs must secure an approved local partner. Uh, Falun Gong is a meditative martial arts movement that uh, started in 1992. At first, it was supported by the party state, and then in the late 1990s, its popularity led to the imposition of restrictions by the state. It got too big. Okay, and so thousands of practitioners were then arrested, even though it was sponsored by the state at one point. And many were tortured and likely killed for organ harvesting. Uh, strong government crackdowns on demonstrations and protests are seen in China, including Gong and, of course, the Tiananmen Square killings. Uh, the government heavily censors website content and has forced um, um, some big trouble in recent years, uh, curtailing uh, Weibo and WeChat. Um, Labeled the Golden Shield by the government, uh, and more colloquially known as the Great Firewall of China, uh, the party state's huge project of social media control has been surprisingly successful. Uh, however, even as the party has banned Twitter, has banned Facebook, Instagram, um, 
Yahoo and Google have cowed down to, to China in order to be able to come in. Uh, they have taken control of China's domestic private internet service providers. The CCP's net nannies have not been able to fully tame China's mobile phone-based microblogs. For several years, the popular microblogging service Weibo, which literally means microblog, uh, offered a relatively open venue for Chinese to express their opinions and share uncensored news and rumors. In 2012, the central government cracked down on Weibo by no longer permitting anonymous postings, filtering and censoring sensitive content, flooding the site with pro-government propaganda and punishing those who violated strict new laws governing the site. But for all the party state's uh, capacity, Silencing these proliferating messages, message apps and social networking platforms would be hugely unpopular and perhaps at this point impossible. Um, by 2013, Chinese netizens uh, daily posted over 250 million microblog messages and over 20 billion WeChat and other instant messages. Uh, it remains to be seen how microblogging and micromessaging is going to continue in Chinese society and perhaps even in its politics. Um, so we'll see how that goes from here. As we said earlier, Han Chinese make up about 90% of the population, which is incredibly homogenous. But still, China recognizes at least 55 minority nationalities. Make sure you read about these in the book, especially the Uyghurs, okay? Uh, they've been on the AP test many times, so let's make sure we're reading these things, not just paying attention to the... Um, to the lectures. Uh, but many minorities reside in autonomous areas that make up uh, more than 60% of China's territories. Violent conflicts in Jiaxing and Tibet stem from a demand for greater autonomy from these ethnic groups. Uh, there is also tremendous linguistic diversity in China. Um, since the 20th century, the government has imposed Mandarin as the official language, but think about all of those different ethnic um, um, diversity, diversity, and then think about just the dialects that must happen across that big country. And so Mandarin is the official language, but think of all the languages that really must be spoken there. Uh, looking ideology and uh, political culture-wise, uh, we see that China has a long history of centrally imposed authoritarian politics dates back thousands of years. The importance of Maoist and communist ideas waned since Mao's death, but despite Mao's rejection of Confucian ideals, current leaders have embraced those values as legitimate, traditional legitimacy. However, modern cultural values, especially in urban areas, are giving way to individualism. Uh, China is known to have fierce nationalism and xenophobia, uh, that both have been cornerstones of Chinese political culture. Uh, let's look at the political economy as well. Under Mao, uh, from 1949 to 1978, China adopted the Soviet-style communist political economic model. Uh, the iron rice bowl is a term used to refer to um, an occupation which guaranteed job security as well as steady income and benefits. Uh, there was state ownership here of all property and the development of heavy industry needed uh, massive bureaucratic oversight. The Reds versus Experts uh, policy, the Reds versus Experts uh, policy favored party cadres over those with economic training, which led to um, the Great Leap Forward, uh, which was a colossal failure. Uh, beyond that, the Cultural Revolution led, left China a poor, isolated country. So two years after Mao's death in 1976, Deng led the country through economic reform and opening. So what we're seeing is we're going to listen to this guy who's a friend of mine um, who's in the Communist Party instead of this guy who's an economist who is not. Okay, This guy might just be taking a guess. This guy's using statistics, but I'm going to talk to this guy because he's in the Communist Party. So that's kind of what we're looking at here with the Reds versus the experts. Uh, after Mao's death, agricultural communes were disbanded and were gradually replaced with the household responsibility system. Uh, this was an agricultural production system which allowed households to contract land, uh, machinery, uh, other facilities from collective organizations. Industries were then decentralized while collective and village enterprises took their place. This allowed for more economic freedom and people were now encouraged to generate profits. 
1979, the government created special economic zones to end economic isolation. Uh, this zone, we're going to be doing this. We're going to be doing this and this zone. We're going to be doing this. Special economic zones are being, going to be dictated to what to do, but they're going to have some freedom in there. By the 1990s, the socialist command economy had been transformed into a socialist market economy. So since the 1990s, state party reformers have uh, sold off or closed down tens of thousands of inefficient state-owned enterprises. Uh, which brings us to the Beijing Consensus. Uh, China's neo-mercantilism development model, which uses preferential state treatment for domestic firms, has hampered prospects for foreign companies. Okay, The Beijing Consensus, we're going to help the people in the country and hurt the people outside the country when it comes to um, the economy. China's growth model has brought with it uh, a lot of challenges. The Iron Rice Bowl has given way to labor mobility, job uncertainty, uh, unemployment. Inequality has grown between uh, individuals and regions. Rural China remains poor. Urban East Coast prospers. Uh, rapid industrial development has created huge resource shortages and environmental damage. Huge problem for, for uh, China is the environmental damage. Half a billion people in China lack safe drinking water. Another half a billion breathe dangerously unsafe air, where they actually have um, air pollution alerts where they tell people, do not go outside today. It's too dangerous to breathe outside today. Uh, despite successful development, China's economic growth is starting to slow down a little bit. Uh, as for foreign relations for China, remember China wanted isolation for the better part of 4,000 years. However, since Mao's death, China has steadily in, emerged from this isolate, isolation to become an important international player. By the 1970s, most other countries had normalized relations with China and ceased to recognize Taiwan. Uh, concerns about China's powerful rise due to its nationalist tendencies and current territorial disputes have risen. Uh, China regards Taiwan as a private province of China, that, uh, and it demands it to reintegrate into the Chinese culture. There have also been uh, territorial standoffs with Japan over some islands in the China Sea, and there is a special relationship with North Korea where China kind of plays the diplomatic role here uh, regarding nuclear threats. So let's go ahead and wrap up with the current issues in China. Uh, China has become the world's biggest uh, producer of greenhouse gases and the largest energy consumer. Uh, air, soil, and water pollution have reached extremely high toxic levels in, the, in many areas of the country. This is because they are a very industrial country, not a service country like we've talked about with the UK. Uh, its population has led to acid rain in much of Asia. Uh, the party state has been in encouraging efforts of uh, environmental NGOs targeting green energy as a leading economic growth sector. Uh, corruption challenges uh, economic growth and political stability. Uh, that corruption is exacerbated, um, it, it has exacerbated inequality and frustrations while uh, with the elite. Um, Xi Jinping has made sweeping anti-corruption campaign efforts, but there are rising concerns about how badly this is going to hurt uh, the economy. Uh, and at the end of the day, it all comes down to the Communist Party is still in charge. And so whatever direction they decide to go, that's the direction of the country of China. That's China, my friends. Uh, lots to chew on here in, in this chapter. Um, make sure that you're doing the reading. Make sure you're doing the re reading questions and keeping up with everything for, uh, for our week with China. Uh, once we finish China, we're going to do a shortened version of Iran, and then we're going to do Mexico and Nigeria in just one week. And friends, we're going to be at that AP test. Those practice scores look awesome. This class is awesome. We're going to have threes, fours, and fives all over the place. I challenge you guys, don't be that weak link. Get that three, that four, that five. Be the class who gets a 100% uh, passing rate on the AP test. I know you can do it. I've got confidence in you. Remember, if you have questions, reach out to me. Come see me if I'm here. Email me, tweet me. Do what you have to do to get a hold of me. I will help you. We'll see you next time.